Elaine Petricelli, and I am so happy to welcome you here tonight to celebrate Her Wild Oats, a book I adore. Uh, and uh, part of it is that it's really, really, really well written, and it's funny, and it's great, and I can hear Kathy reading it to me every page. Uh, but the person I really want to introduce tonight is my colleague at Book Passage, uh, who uh, is in charge of our Path to Publishing program, and is my dear friend, and also the husband of Kathy came in Goldbar. And so it's my pleasure to turn this over to the magnificent Sam Berry. That's uh, Sam Berry over there. <laughs> Him shortly. Um, no, that's David Phillips. Let's give a big hand for David Phillips. <laughs> David is one of Kathy's, uh, well, it's, this is hard to say, one of Kathy's oldest friends because after Kathy uh, died, people, uh, I swear, I got emails from people saying, Sam, you don't know me. I'm not sure Kathy remembers me in third, in third grade. Kathy was there for me, and it was unbelievable. The outpouring of love. Kathy was so supportive of people that they remembered it forever. And that woman did eventually get out of third grade, by the way. <laughs> but um, uh, no, David Phillips, is, he's a great musician, a pedal steel player, great renown here in the Bay Area, and actually has to run after this gig, uh, this event to a gig. So I thank him so much for coming up and doing this. But I know he's doing it for the woman he really loved a lot, Kathy Goldmark, Kathy Kane Goldmark, because. Uh, among other things, among many other projects they did together, one that I'm going to mention is the Los Trainwreck Jam. <laughs> we were called Trainwreck, but uh, then Jack Black came to town with a band of that name, and San Francisco was too small, and so we named ourselves Los Trainwreck, which apparently is grammatically incorrect. <laughs> well, I know, I don't know Spanish, so you know, I, I love Trainwreck in Spanish. The, uh, but David is a great player, he came up here to do a little something with me tonight. And uh, if you ever want to hear David and me uh, and Los Trainwreck, you should come to El Rio in the Mission, or, or just find Los Trainwreck on Facebook. Um, and I want to say a couple of quick thank yous. Um, I first want to thank, I, I first want to acknowledge that we have Paul Kamen here, Kathy's brother, who is a great guy. <laughs> So, and, uh, and then I want to mention um, also, I want to thank three really, really very important people. They are Tony Goldmark, Kathy's son, and Daniel and Laura, my kids and her stepchildren, who she loved dearly and they loved her. Uh, they really were, all, those three were inspirations to us, continue to be inspirations to me. So I want to mention those great three people. I want to thank Elaine and Bill Petricelli, who make this place happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they do not do it alone. They do it with an amazing staff. And I've had a work here. It's just an unbelievable group of people. Um, it's just one of the greatest, uh, really creative groups of people. And that's why this is one of the great uh, bookstores in America. And um, I want to thank um, Amy and Suzanne. But we'll, we'll see them in a little bit. I'll talk a little bit more about them. And uh, um, I want to thank Jay Hartman and Katie Sullivan who are here tonight. That they are the publishers of this book, I'm Free Reads. <laughs> also, Joelle Del, Del Borgo was not here tonight, but she was Kathy's uh, literary agent. And she called me up about two months after Kathy died and said, we've got to get this book published. And that just doesn't usually happen, folks. So um, I want to give Joelle credit as well as Jay and Kitty. Uh, and uh, Lee Kravitz is here tonight. He's the guy who wrote that great article in the Simpsons. <laughs> and and uh, I really love that. Uh, I mean, I didn't know that was going to happen. Uh, I don't think Lee knew that was going to happen. Anyhow, he wrote that great article. He also wrote a, a book which we had an event for. He's the co-author of a book called Super Survivors, which I recommend. It's a wonderful book. Um, and in general, there are a lot of people here, so I'm just going to say it this way. 
I want to thank the Bay Area Literary Community for being so supportive uh, of, of this and of me and of, and of you know of each other really because this is a really loving and caring group and uh, uh, of people. It's kind of amazing because you know it, it, it could be it could be another way, right? But there's a lot of love around here. Um, so um, I just want to quickly say a few things. Um, about Kathy, and then we're going to sing a little song for you that she wrote. Uh, one thing I want to say about Kathy, and I think it's essential that I said, and some of you will know why, is that laminating was very important to Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that came to my mind, but she wrote laminating, and Kathy was again, her, the reason I mentioned it is because Kathy was, she took care of so many people, she understood what was important, she nurtured along. There are authors all over this country, all over the world, who say, you know, I had two people at my event, but she said, just hang in there, it's gonna be great, she made me feel good, she said, your writing is wonderful. And um, she was that kind of a spirit. Uh, but she also knew that laminating was important. And I just wanna say, <laughs> 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 Kathy, maybe had a little loopy side too, but I don't know if you When I moved in, there was leopard print carpet um, on the entire, basic, the base, the, you know, the main floor of this house was leopard print carpeting, and I said, I'm a very, I'm really a pretty nice guy. I said, I, I don't think I can live with this much leopard. <laughs> no, I, and she was sweet. She said, can I just keep it in my office? So she kept it in her office along with the really like red lacquer shiny paint. And it was a wild office to walk into. Um, and um, she led an amazing life from, you know, Long Island to, being the being with a rock star, one of the uh, first members, of, one of the original members of the band Steely Dan, uh, was her boyfriend before he was in Steely Dan. So she wound up in this rock star life, and so did he. Uh, and then she wound up promoting birth control. Uh, and at one point in Mexico City, she did a, a, a project which was about you know basically would have people like Tom Petty go on. You know, man, people hang with me, you know, we use condoms because we, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I have these tapes, they're all these tapes. Yeah. Frank Zappa, she, she asked Frank Zappa about you know, birth control, Frank Zappa said, I don't know, he asked my wife, I <laughs> <laughs> Which shows that he didn't. Yeah. Um, and um, in fact, when she was in Mexico City, she herself marveled that they were advisors to the Mexican government, a guy named Angel uh, and Martinez and Kathy were advisors on birth control and, and kind of used to the Mexican government. I'm not making this up. And, uh, <laughs> they learned that one of the important things to do was the smallest size of condom, condom should be labeled super jumbo. <laughs> Notice the women laughing. Yeah. Right? She was, she was also something uh, that a lot of you know was a literary, she was a media escort. She was a fabulous media escort. I already explained it. That meant that she slept with all the... <laughs> <laughs> she stood there with a sign and picked them up and took care of them. There were no cell phones back then. She took care of them, she rode around. And like I said, she, she took people who were in a fragile state, often sleepless and scared and worried about their book, and she made them have fun. She would have these leopard sunglasses on her, wild red hair, you know, and she she could show you the town, believe me. She could show you San Francisco. She had that town wired. And uh, she was also a record producer. She produced West Coast Live, that radio show for many years. She was a songwriter. She's, of course, an author. She wrote a book before this book that we're, doing, we're celebrating tonight. She wrote a book called Anna Shoes, Keep Walking Back to You, and a number of other projects. Um, and she, she, she was an event promoter. Um, really extraordinary, but above all, she was the world's greatest connector, I think, ever of people that I've ever known. And just uh, when she was dying in um, USF's um, lobby, actually, I remember this, because um, I think about a thousand people, it felt like, showed up that day. And uh, and she, um, that was a lie, and that's why they lied. <laughs> 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 like hundreds of people. <laughs> They had us in this room and they quickly saw like people descending on us on this room and they were like, oh, we're gonna move you to another room. <laughs> and we all moved to another room and um, and people like, um, if, if you'll remember David, like Judy Collins called to sing Amazing Grace over the phone. 
Roger McGuinn called to sing The Wind Beneath Your Wings. And she, uh, Maya Angelou used to call Kathy her play daughter, and they loved each other a lot. And uh, I just loved that the paper of record, the New York Times, the paper that we know gets everything right, said <laughs> that Maya was in the room, which was uh, not true. Maya oh. called, and, you know, but, and so uh, later on, Tony Goldmark, Tony, her son, said to me, Sam, was I that out of it in the way you hadn't seen Maya Angelou? <laughs> Um, so, um, uh, she was an amazing person, I think I've conveyed that. Um, she really uh, wanted everybody, you might say, if you want to put it in a musical metaphor, which is apt for Kathy because she was both a writer and a musician, she wanted everybody to be in the band. Uh, she just wanted everybody to be in the band. In fact, the low straight train wreck jam sometimes would end up with the entire bar up on stage. <laughs> everybody, there would be nobody listening. <laughs> Over <laughs> and everybody would be singing, be my, be my. She would say, all the women, all the men too. <laughs> Which in San Francisco is fine. And she just wanted everybody in the band. And um, and I, I should mention one other band, since we're talking about it, which is the Rock Bottom Remainders, which she founded. And, and uh, you know, which she's uh, certainly remembered for, among these many other things I mentioned. Um, and the Rock Bottom Remainders, uh, uh, the requirement to be in the Remainders was that you not be a good musician. So many authors, <laughs> they'd, many authors she, they'd go, Kathy, why don't be in the Rock Bottom Remainders? Does anyone here not know who the Rock Bottom Remainders are? Go. Good, because I don't want to explain it. Okay? <laughs> There's a couple of members here tonight, so including me and then one other person. And, and possibly many more. I mean, at one point, almost every author in the United States has been <laughs> with the Rock Bottom Remainders. But, but to really be in the band, you, you, you know, they would, she'd go, well, what are you playing? And they'd go, well, I'm a good, good sax player. And she'd go, oh, OK. Because they wouldn't realize that that was a big mistake. <laughs> okay. and Scott Terrell called up and said, I, I, I want to be in the band. I'm, I'm hurt that I'm not in this band. Every author wants to be in this band. And she said, what are you playing? He said, I, I don't play anything. I just want to be in the band. And he was in. <laughs> <laughs> Revlon Jr. and uh, Matt Green. Revlon Jr. of Wei Wei Don't Tell Me and many great books and uh, sport and many, many wonderful writers. And uh, Matt Green is the creator of The Simpsons. Neither of those men have any music. I don't think they have one ounce of music. <laughs> <laughs> so let's sing a song. That's what we should do now, I think. Yeah. You get David up, and uh, I'm gonna sing a song. And because I'm middle aged, I'm gonna tell you a little story about this song. Okay. Oh, I blew it. Wait one second. <laughs> <laughs> Los Trek plays the second Tuesday of the month at the El Rio. And we start about 8 o'clock. And I would say Kathy's idea for this was to remove the boundary between the audience and the band. So, uh, so she would try to get people to get up and sing or play. And the people who wouldn't, then she got up, got the idea to do the girl group from the summer. People would be like, oh, he's a harmony singer. It really does and then if they wouldn't do that, then she brought kazoos. <laughs> so, and Jim Foster's here. He's, he had, she gave him a golden kazoo. Oh. Gold plated. Yeah, I'm here tonight. So I'm sorry. This song we were going to do, I, I forgot something really. Lordy, weird. Lordy. I didn't know about this. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> I wouldn't get any better if I didn't make up <laughs> Okay, so, Kathy wrote this song with her friend Kathleen and Ryan. And they were down in Austin. Down by Southwest. It was a song, it was a song, they're laughing at something. It was a song about um, an experience they had in a bar. They'd been just having a great time seeing music and then they were having a couple of drinks in the, in the booth and in walked a man 
almost as gorgeous as me. And uh, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the cheek bumps. Kathy was like cheek bumps, and I always said, why are you married to me? I don't actually. Yeah. But anyhow, and, but, uh, and, and, she, and this guy walked in, he was just gorgeous, and they all started adjusting their bra straps and flipping their hair and making them too long. And, um, and, and you know what happened? Well, absolutely nothing. <laughs> because they were middle-aged women. And they were sitting over here, and this young stuff, he didn't see them. At least that was what they said. I found that hard to believe. But so Kathy and Kathleen wrote this little song about being in Austin, looking at the scenery, and the scenery didn't look bad at all. <laughs> Suzanne Parry um, is a wonderful, wonderful writer and author of The Fortune Catcher. Um, and uh, 
She also worked on a really great event um, that just was kind of ahead of its time called Book Group Expo. I don't know if any of you remember it, but it was an amazing thing. And um, uh, there, it, it was 25 literary salons uh, all at once. It was just fabulous. It was this amazing event down in, in San Jose. Uh, and she's a member of the National Book Critics Circle Award, and the Author Guild, and the San Francisco Writers Grotto. And, just, and also, by the way, uh, just about carried me through some of my own tough times uh, in the last uh, couple of years. And uh, I, so I want to thank um, Suzanne and also her husband, Sharam, who's here. He's a great guy. And, um, and when he's not flying um, drones around. <laughs> it's an inside joke. <laughs> hey, so, um, the, uh, I wasn't in any way about making a politically incorrect joke about the Iranian uh, American descent. <laughs> he actually does fly drones. <laughs> and then, um, so, uh, and, and Suzanne is here along with Amy Tan, who is a member of the Rock Bottom Remainders and, of course, a great author and uh, a wonderful friend who also carried me through uh, some of the roughest times I've seen in my life. And so I'm so glad they're here. I'm going to turn it over right now to uh, the amazing Amy Tan, who's going to come up and do a little reading for us from the book, I think. Okay. <laughs> were almost the best were those that backfired <laughs> um, and came to, to haunt her or haunt me. Um, one of them actually happened, the two of us together, we were in the band playing in Washington, D.C., and there was a VIP reception. And as Sam has already said, laminates were a big thing with Kathy, as were wigs. And so Kathy had on, um, I had on a long black wig and my laminate, and Kathy on it had on a real curly red one. And we decided at the VIP uh, reception we would exchange wigs and laminates, see what happened. Well, oh. she had this the nice little slim Jewish corrected nose. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I'm pretty Chinese and, you know, my brown cheeks. And we thought, well, it would just be kind of funny. And, and then this woman came up and she said, oh, to Kathy, are you Amy Tan? <laughs> advice on this book, the manuscripts in the car, and oh, I was, you know, you could just give me some helpful hints, and, and Kathy says, oh, this is this is my friend, Kathy Goldberg, and I'm like, hi. And, uh, <laughs> um, and, and so for the, the rest of the time at this VIP reception, Kathy was giving the woman advice on what to do with her manuscript, which was actually very good advice, the same advice that I would have <laughs> so, um, but later on, we had to get up on stage, and we had to put our wigs on, uh, our appropriate wigs and our the laminates, and we were going to stand on stage and we're in the back room, and the in the what they didn't really have green rooms; they had like a little hallway or something. But we we're thinking, oh no. She's going to see us, and she's going to be so moving. <laughs> and we ended up writing an, an essay in, in the book, the, the um, book that came out that we all contributed to. And, uh, and we both said we were sorry to that one. <laughs> anyway, that, that's the kind of thing that we would do. Um, one more thing. I, the, other, the other day, I just really got a hit of Kathy. Um, and it's something I've been hoping for for a long time. We kind of talked about getting a sign. And um, so 
a, a few months ago I was on tour, I came back, I, I wear this purple outfit all the time, it's wrinkle free, and, you know, you can throw it in the washing machine or hand wash it. And I got back and I had the pants, but this top was missing. And I thought, that can't be. So I looked everywhere for it, looked, had people look in New York where I had been, and uh, for weeks I looked for this thing. It wasn't there. I assumed it was stolen and the, uh, from my luggage. And the other day, I went to my closet and I had to do a TV interview and a photo shoot. And I, I stood there with what it used to be. And I just said, that would have, that's the thing I would have worn. And it's just, I don't have it. And I'm looking at it. And it's like, it's, it looks just like the jacket. And it is. <laughs> and my immediate thought was Kathy. And the thing also is, my closet is so neat. I have somebody who's who's obsessive. All the hangers are exactly one and a half inches apart. All the sleeves are tucked in a certain way. This thing was wadded up and kind of hung all askew and sticking out. So. That sounds like it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, it was unmistakably not my housekeeper. Not Lou, not anybody. Nobody else goes in there. I just looked at him and I said, Kathy. And so I call, I asked Sam, I said, what day is today? It is after your wedding. It's before her birthday. What What's going on today that is special to Kathy? And he said, the newspaper article came out announcing that her book has been published and that we would be reading it here at Book Passage. And I said, OK, good. I'll be there. And I'm <laughs> do justice to reading um, a few pages of the book, Wild Oats. Um, okay, so we begin. The title, 357. 3.11 a.m. How could you be married to a guy for over three years and not know he owned a gun? Arizona Rosenblatt stared at the digital display on her bedside alarm clock, the only light in a pitch black room. Jerry snored. The locomotive snore, not the general <laughs> snore, beside her. 3.13, eyes wide open, brain buzzing a mile a minute. Jerry's behavior had been getting more and more bizarre, and just last night she planned out about the Smith & Wesson 357 Magnum. He brought it into their bedroom to show her, like it was a new appliance he thought she would enjoy. It was the biggest gun Arizona had ever seen up close. Actually, it was the first gun she'd ever seen up close. And it was still sitting a few feet away on Jerry's bedside table. Apparently, the gun had been in the house for months, maybe longer, without her ever knowing. They'd been watching CSI Des Moines. <laughs> <laughs> watching CSI, Des Moines, as they often did before going to bed. On the show, someone had asked if the safety was on a Smith & Wesson 357 Magnum, and Jerry went berserk. Everyone knows a 357 has no safety, he fumed. How could they have been so careless with their research? This used to be my favorite show, but the writing has gone to shit. <laughs> oh, come on, Jerry, she laughed. Just sit back and enjoy the gritty realism of gorgeous young actors in cocktail attire playing cops. <laughs> They'd stomp around, downing a couple of shots, ease the pain while getting out his own 357, to show her how it was really supposed to work. She was dismayed at the discovery that there was a gun in her home. But when she tried to talk it over, he'd laugh dismissively. I've owned a gun all my life, baby. It's perfectly legal. It's registered. What's your problem? I'm a lawyer, an officer of the court. Then he turned out the light and gone to bed with the gun, a gun without a safety, no less, mm -hmm. sitting there on the table. <laughs> 317. Jerry mumbled something unintelligible and threw one hairy, muscular arm over her stomach, drawing her closer. His snores grew louder his grip stronger. Arizona usually liked to cuddle, but tonight her husband's arm felt like it belonged to a stranger. She tried inching away. He held on tighter. She waited. When his snoring resumed its deep and added oil rhythm, she slowly removed his heavy limp from across her stomach. To be safe, she lay perfectly still 
until she was sure he was still asleep. Then she slipped out of bed. Arizona tiptoed downstairs and turned on the light in her brightly colored kitchen. She began warming some milk, sat down at the table, and booted up her laptop. The desktop art came into focus, a digital version of her favorite wedding photo, just as the milk began to bubble in the pan. She poured some into a mug and sat for a minute looking at the picture, wistful as she recalled their large, festive wedding at a private club in the hills above LA. It was a happy picture. Arizona, slim and tall in her embroidered Mexican wedding dress, with a few simple white flowers adorning her long, honey blonde hair. Jerry's smiling face and muscular frame in a flamboyant red tuxedo with a rubber <laughs> shirt, his arm around her shoulders. They were surrounded by their favorite people, all laughing while raising glasses in a toast. Everyone had teased them, saying they looked like they were going to two different weddings. In fact, Jerry's doofus brother had picked up the wrong tux at the dry cleaners, and there had been no time to correct things before the ceremony. Erzo sometimes wondered about the lucky prom-bound boy who'd ended up in her husband's Armani, imagining how the word wrote malfunction, malfunction may have changed his life. Since she was wide awake and stressed out anyway, it seemed like a perfect time to balance her checkbook. So she logged onto her online banking site and entered her password. Her paycheck, direct deposit, posted. Great, and not a minute too soon. Despite the nice salary she earned as assistant to the head of Gargantuan Entertainment, lately the money had been going out faster than it was coming in. Though Arizona was sure she'd left enough in the account to cover, it looked as though her deposit had hit just in the nick of time to prevent an overdraft. Going through the last couple of days, she recognized payments to her dentist and to the phone company and a purchase at the grocery store. Then she saw the $1,750 debit. She had no memory of writing a check that size. Certainly, she wasn't paid enough to forget spending that amount in one place. She clicked the view option and an image appeared on the screen bearing her signature made up to a recipient whose name made her slam the mug down on the table mm -hmm. in surprise, spraying hot milk all over her silk pajamas, painting to the order of Jews for Jesus. Oh <laughs> she stared at the screen, wondering how this would be, but the bank had made some kind of mistake. A closer look revealed that what had passed for her signature was in a familiar handwriting, Jerry's. How could he have done this without asking? Hands shaking, she clipped through her statements and found several similar checks, each for over $1,000. At least this explained why she felt so strapped lately. It took some effort to stay calm as she tried to make sense of the situation. When she'd asked Jerry to help her figure out why, with two executive level salaries, they always seemed to be broke, he patted her ass and said, no worry, baby in a condescending tone. So she quietly opened her own checking account and arranged for direct deposit of her salary. But somehow, he managed to get a hold of her checks. And once again, they would barely be able to cover their monthly nut. The situation had gone from mystifying to annoying to alarming. And this was downright creepy. Arizona opened her email and typed in her password. Access denied, said a cheerful little pop-up icon. Oh, girl, calm down, she whispered. You're going too fast. Let's try this again. Slowly, carefully, she entered the password once more. This time it worked. Looking at her email and save folders, she realized that everything about her, her social security number, bank account numbers, all her contacts were available to anyone who could get into this email account. Hadn't she once told Jerry the password she hadn't changed in years? She wouldn't have imagined he would stoop this low, but then neither would she have thought that he'd steal her checks. Why was he doing this? What had changed? Who was the snoring man in the other room, really? Searching for clues, she crept into the living room and found Jerry's briefcase on the coffee table. She told herself that the check he'd forged trumped his right to privacy as she started sifting through the contents. There were the usual papers from his job at Hanson Whitehurst Phelps and Barnes, 
where he worked as an entertainment attorney, along with the latest issue of men's fitness. Nothing weird there. But in a zipper pouch inside a briefcase, she found a packet of condoms, a small plastic bottle of Listerine, and a tiny pad with cryptic scribbled notes. Monday, 7 p.m., SL at Hollywood and Vine. Tuesday, Venice Beach, 3 p.m. There was also some photos of a very curvy blonde wearing nothing but tiny panties that barely had enough room to display the charming motto, Jesus has got my butt. <laughs> <laughs> There was, there was a handwritten note on the back of one of the photos. In glittery purple ink, someone had written, Counting the minutes until Orlando, baby, can't wait. The handwriting was round, the eyes dotted with hearts, and the note was signed with a hot pink lipstick kiss. Arizona waited for her discovery of Jerry's obvious affair to hit her stomach in the cold, hollow place. She waited for rage to make her ears buzz and tears to spring to her eyes. When none of the usual physical reactions to betrayal appeared, she realized the news wasn't a surprise. As Arizona closed the pad and opened his briefcase to put in it back, an index card fluttered out from between two of the pages, bearing Jerry's handwritten scrawl. To meet for those who perish at men's hands, to cherish hope, divine, that they shall be raised up by God again, but thou shalt have no resurrection to life, <coughs> followed by Arizona's name and a date and time, 8 a.m. that very morning, just a few hours away. There in the middle of her living room, in the middle of the night, nothing felt right or good or safe. Jerry's odd behavior, the missing money, a bizarre threat in biblical language, a gun, she had no idea what was happening. This was worse than an affair. And it was then that the cold, hollow feeling in her gut and the buzzing in her ears kicked in. Arizona tiptoed into the kitchen to fill a paper sack with a few provisions, a couple of bottles of water, leftover half sandwich, strongly turkey and coleslaw, a small bag of sun chips and orange, found the old Cuban cigar box in which they kept a stash of cash for emergencies, counted out exactly half, and began putting the box away, but she, the thought hit her. Wait a minute, he's stolen thousands from my account, and he's plotting to kill me. Why should I leave them half? <laughs> so she opened the box again and emptied the contents into her purse. <laughs> then she found a scrap of paper, scribbled it up, and left it on the table. Jerry, she wrote hastily. I'm going out of town for a few days. Talk soon, Ari. She thought about leaving her heavy gold wedding band on top of the note, but feared the gesture too melodramatic. Besides, a chunk of 24 karat might come in handy later on. <laughs> Arizona pulled the soft canvas bag out of the hall closet, stepped into the bathroom, and began gathering essentials, toothpaste, deodorant, bubble bath, and the six different high-end products she used to maintain her long mane of hair. The clothes might be harder to finish. She made a mental list and could only hope that Jerry would sleep soundly enough not to notice her collecting a couple of changes of underwear, shorts and socks and sandals, the worn green hoodie she'd had since college, a bathing suit. She crept quietly up the stairs and into the bedroom, timing the opening of closet doors and drawers with his loud snores. She tried to stay calm, tried not to pay attention to the gun on the nightstand or the wild pounding of her heart. It was crucial that she get herself dressed, packed, and out of the house before Jerry woke up, before he realized what she found. 3.53. Jerry stirred and mumbled something, someone's name. Arizona strained to hear, then realized it didn't matter because it wasn't hers. <laughs> she stood across the dark bedroom, stifling a gasp as she saw that Jerry's arms were wrapped around Madison, who had somehow made his way from the sofa in the den into their bed. Madison's shiny black teddy bear eyes were open, pleading, looking right at her. She'd been a sucker for this yearning stare for so long. She couldn't leave without Madison. As she crept back toward the bed, Jerry settled back into slumber. She might just have a shot at prying Madison out of Jerry's arms without waking him up. She sat gingerly on the edge of the bed and 
slowly, inch by nerve-wracking inch, loosened Jerry's grip on Madison, stopping, still, stopping, breathing. Every time Jerry moved, she almost had him free when Jerry shouted out, pushed her away, and reached for the bed stand. 3.57. She stood flat against the wall, trying to blend into the darkness as he groped for the weapon. Jerry, now clutching the gun in his sleep, lay back against the pillows. Arizona willed herself to wait until he settled down again. Half a dozen seconds felt like hours, but she finally heard his snores resume, her heart beating so fast and loud she could hear it. Arizona began to ease her beloved Madison out of Jerry's grasp. Madison, oh, come on. She didn't realize she'd said anything out loud, but watched in horror as Jerry bolted upright and looked around the room in a panic, waving his gun wildly. Arizona placed her hand on her husband's forehead and managed to soothe him with, shh, it's okay, it's just me, go back to sleep. She watched, not daring to move, as he settled back against the pillows and into sleep. And she was finally able to pull Madison gently out of his arms, replacing him with a pillow. <laughs> Holding Madison against her chest, she finished packing. Without knowing why, she threw a pair of high-heeled pumps, <laughs> saw the creepy little black dress, and rhinestone earrings on top of the jumble of cotton and denim. Never know when you'll be invited to a prom, was the odd thought that crossed her mind as she zipped up her gun. On her way downstairs, she turned for a moment to take one last look at her sleeping, sleeping husband before closing the door. No matter how much weird-ass stuff he'd done, he looked harmless enough now, with his muscular arms clinging to that 500-throat cow pillow in her big soft bed. For a moment, she wondered if she should wake Jerry and try to talk things over, and shook the thought away. She was always trying to talk things over with him, but lately every discussion turned into an argument, circular, dissatisfying, and ultimately pointless, as he'd grown more and more defensive and secretive. The things she discovered tonight were too unsettling, too frightening to talk about without taking some serious time to think. She felt safer talking about these things from a distance, on the phone where he couldn't shoot her. <laughs> Jerry rolled over, snoring loudly while releasing a loud, sleepy fart, and she decided to memorize the image for future use in the midst of loneliness or doubt. <laughs> At the bottom of the stairs, she slipped on her beloved red eelskin western boots, threw a denim jacket over her shoulders, and took one last look around. As she scooped Madison up into her arms, the room exploded in a rendition of Teddy Bear's Picnic in his cheerful, tinkling voice. Arizona yelped as she jumped back, almost dropped him, and froze on the bottom step. He stopped as suddenly as he'd begun, and Arizona stood still for a moment. Finally relieved to hear Jerry's snores from the upstairs bedroom. Later, she'd wonder if she had had the courage to leave, if not for Jerry's perfectly timed fart and <laughs> snoring combo, or if Madison bursting into song was some kind of omen. <laughs> Madison had once been like my, you know, Madison had once been a very, very expensive teddy bear, a little turnkey on his back engaged an internal music box that had long since died. His mouth was still stained with the hard remains of the soft-boiled egg Arizona had tried to feed him when she was four. His hide reduced to bare patches in certain huggable places. The teddy bear's music box had not worked since the late 70s until now. <laughs> Boots snack and overnight bag, Madison, said Arizona Rosenblatt, all left together. As she let her car coast down the driveway, she wondered if she would see her little house again. Arizona gunned the engine at the back of the block and headed out toward the freeway. As the car came to life, so did Gertrude, a portable <coughs> GPS unit she kept plugged into the cigarette lighter. 408. Make the first available U-turn, <laughs> Gertrude, in her mechanical British accent as Harry ignored all instructions and headed toward the interstate. Just cool it, Gertrude. I could pull your plug any time, you know. <laughs> Arizona's employer had provided her with a brand new iPhone, an instrument with far more sophisticated GPS capabilities than the truths. But as with Madison, she felt a sentimental attachment to her old device and immediately felt sorry for her scolding tone. 
It's just you and me now, Gertrude. It's gonna be okay. Gertrude wasn't so sure. She repeatedly urged the first available U-turn. <laughs> but instead of unplugging the little machine, Arizona noticed a tone of edginess, then agitation creeping <laughs> into Gertrude's voice. And she found herself wondering how far she could go until Gertrude gave up her popped a gasket. As the sky grew lighter, Arizona compared Gertrude's imaginary frustration with her own agitation and growing fears about Jerry still asleep in their Santa Monica bungalow. Recalculating, said Gertrude. <laughs> you bet your ass. He was applauding. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kathy always brought people together, and she's still bringing people together. I see so many people's faces I haven't seen in a long time. <laughs> well, I'm not going to talk for very long, but and I'm not going to read, but I'll tell you a little bit about Kathy and her book. Kathy and I tried hard to remember when exactly we first met. We knew so many of the same people, it was impossible to figure out. I want to believe it was Amy who introduced us, because Amy and I were with her at the end. Then again, it really doesn't matter. Kathy and I had a million things in common, and at the same time, we were completely different. To name a few, I am not quirky. <laughs> <laughs> I knew <need> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's true, I'm a little quirky. A little? Stop. <laughs> that was my husband. <laughs> I need more than three hours of sleep a night. I can't shower, do my hair, put on makeup, and get dressed in 15 minutes flat. I can be judgmental and a bitch. In all our years as friends and working together, Kathy got angry with me only once at our third book group expo when I failed to catch the omission of Elaine Petrocelli's name in the program. <laughs> Elaine, this officially counts as my 358th apology. <laughs> <laughs> had one child, one son. Um, the mothers of extraordinary, if I may say so myself, only sons, are in fact also extraordinary, particularly in their levels of anxiety, which are through the roof, and their tolerance for verbal abuse. When Kathy showed me the first draft of her Wild Oats, I was not surprised to discover that one of the main characters, Otis Ray Pixley, also known as Oats, is an unusually talented 13-year-old boy who can communes with grown-ups easily and has a wacky mother. <laughs> Her wild oath stands for much more than the common expression it signifies. You'll have to read it to find out. <laughs> Kathy and I often had writing dates. We'd meet at coffee shops away from our home offices and families and friends, away from all the people we couldn't say no to. And we'd sit across from one another and silently click away on our keyboards. We exchanged drafts and tried out character names and chapter titles on one another, all the while policing one another's internet use, texting, and phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't always good workers. One time we agreed to meet halfway between our houses at Starbucks in Burlingame, each waiting patiently for the other to show up. This was a while ago. Who knew there was more than one Starbucks? <laughs> it took us a while to concede that the other one was, wasn't just a tad late, as usual. And we wound up saying, fuck it, to the writing and met at a bar for drinks. <laughs> anyway, I could tell Kathy stories all night, but for the people out there who didn't know Kathy, there's no better way to spend a few hours with her than to read her wild oats. 
It's a full expression of her nature and the way she lived her life, filled with characters, each touching another in some meaningful way, despite obstacles and mistakes and secrets. In this fictional world, as in Kathy's world, we're all connected. No one is alone. Everyone, well, almost everyone, is good and given a chance to prove it. At the center of it all is the most lovable character in our world, the young, sweet, wonder boy, Oates. In the background is his mother, Sarah Jean, who at one point in the story says, I still think a party's a flop if it doesn't end in a jam. <laughs> That's pure Kathy. I hope you bought this time. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. So, um, that bad. <laughs> Bobo showed that he's capable of defending Amy under the dire circumstances. The, so I, I, I thank you all for coming. I, I just want to take a moment maybe and see if there's a question or two. We don't have a lot of time, but perhaps you have a question or two. I want to thank these two for a wonderful uh, presentation. I do want to say that in no way, I did work with Kathy, I mean in the sense that any writing spouse would work on a book with someone who's writing a book, she wrote this book, but, and I am not Jerry, the creepy guy. <laughs> 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 no, I, and I love Oates, but I am not 13 years old. Okay? <laughs> yeah, really, emotionally, in every way, I'm uh -huh. much more mature than that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, really, damn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I play harmonica too. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. um, she did create, I want, to, I want to take credit for one thing, which was, I mean, it was her idea, but she said, well, so there's a little Walter and a big Walter. Why shouldn't there be? These are two very famous harmonica players, big Walter, incredible musician, little Walter, even more, well, even more extraordinary. And so she thought, why not a medium Walter? <laughs> That's a good idea. That's the way Kathy thought, really. So, um, <laughs> but does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask? Anybody here? How did you and Kathy meet? How did, we, how did Kathy and I meet? We met, there's a, there's a picture of a band up there, which you know, we already talked about the Rock Honor Manners, and one of the members is Dave Barry, who's closely related to me, <laughs> by the way, <laughs> and he's my brother. And he introduced us. In fact, he introduced us way back when, you know, when the Remainers first started, and I met Kathy then. But um, when I moved back here, he said, well, you, you know, books and music, you, you got to talk to Kathy, you know. And that's how we, we got together. Any other, any other, yes? Um, how much editing did you have to do, Sam? You know, this man who was asking this question it had something to do with creating a, there's a CD that, uh, the question was how much editing did I have to do, but I'm not gonna answer it. I'm just gonna ignore it like politicians do and say that. <laughs> a CD called Stranger Than Fiction. And didn't you, weren't you involved in, in, in making it? Uh, Stranger Than Fiction is a real Kathy effort. It's got all these amazing authors. I will only say one thing about it. Aside from Norman Miller's Alimony Blues, he also wrote bodily function blues, but uh, his wife begged Kathy not to release that one. Too. <laughs> but there's a song on here called, my brother Dave is not easy to make laugh, and uh, there's a song on here called, um, Chain gang, you know, that's the sound of the man working. So, Robert Reich, the former Secretary of Labor, I want to sing a song, and he sang that on the scene <laughs> with absolutely perfect diction. That's the sound of the man working. Which actually made my brother pee in his head. <laughs> You buy the CD if you want. <laughs> Stranger than fiction. Um, so anyhow, so what was the question? <laughs> you did ask me a question. Oh, okay. editing. Really, I didn't do as much. I think I did more work on this book when, when Kathy and I were together than I did. The, I, it was really a pretty clean manuscript, right? Very, very, I, got the, I had the editor right here. So I, right? Wasn't it clean? Very, very, yeah. So it was, you know, Kathy's a good writer. So I didn't have to do that much. Any other questions or thoughts? Or just go buy a bunch of copies of this book and yes, yes. Have you heard from her since she 
And the question is, have I heard from Kathy since she died? And I would say that, um, you know, I, I, you know, that's a, a tough question because <laughs> it's a mystery to me. Everything is a mystery, really, if you think about it. And uh, we don't know that much, do we? But um, I would say I definitely have heard from Kathy. It's just I don't hear her voice in the sense of, you know, she talked to me or appeared to me. Uh, like she would to a member of Jesus for Jesus at Mary. No, I'm kind of with Amy a little on this. I, I do sort of feel that her presence is what I would say. And I felt her presence particularly um, in sort of, uh, sort of blessing um, life. She was a lover of life. And if anybody would say, you know, let's rock and roll, keep living, it would be Kathy. So, any other, any other questions? Well, all right. That's a great thing. Thank you so much. <laughs>